Now, this past week, I was in a class on preaching, and today I'm not going to practice anything that I learned. And so today we actually have Javier Carrillo, who is going to be bringing the word to us today. Javier has been a member of our church uh, for quite some time now, at least, I don't know, a year, year and a half. A month. <laughs> he's been a member for a month, but he's been attending here a lot longer than yeah. that. So he's a member in my book. So uh, Javier is a chaplain and Emmanuel in Turlock. And before that, he was the associate pastor at Turlock Covenant, now Hope Church. Uh, he and his wife, Connie, have three kids. Michelle, who is the director of digital marketing, marketing it's a mouthful, at North Park. Their son, Emmanuel, will be a senior at North Park uh, this fall. And then their son, Joel, will be a sophomore. And Joel is the teenager who plays just about anything, uh, but we get him up on stage a lot to play bass. I can't wait to reopen so that we can hear Joel play some more bass lines for us. So today we are lucky to have uh, Javier bring the word. Well, thank you. I thought that I was going to die and not having the opportunity to be on camera. Um, since I know that uh, being at church at home, it's, uh, it's a hard thing. It's so easy to get distracted. So I'm going to go straight to the point. Um, I want to ship two things this morning, if, if possible. My, first, my text is going to be in, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And I'm not going to speak in, a, in, a, in an expositive way, like um, using the text and letting the text uh, speak. I'm going to use this text just as an as a, as a example of how the church has been displaced uh, uh, for the first time in, in the church history. The text uh, speaks about uh, when Saul of Tarsus... Uh, approved the death of the execution of Stephen, who was the first uh, martyr of the church. After that uh, event, the church started um, suffering persecution. So the, the, the worship places where the church uh, met, which were homes, were closed, and the church was uh, displaced uh, throughout the region of uh, Jerusalem, Samaria and Judea and of course the church were not confined to their homes in the church that the believers continued doing what they believed uh, was their call and their purpose was and it was to preach the gospel so I want to um, achieve two goals if possible during these 20 minutes I think the most because I know that uh, again it's so easy to get distracted because I got distracted and I'm not going to tell you what I was doing when, well, Theo was preaching. And, and, but uh, anyway, so I'm sure that you're going to be distracted as well. So what I want to do, uh, I should, if possible, is to admit that the church has been grieving, grieving the loss of, of things and grieving the loss of people and not just missing. Um, and the other thing is that uh, if, if possible, we can review the purpose of, of us as church, as believers, as followers of Jesus, what is, what is, what, why do we do church? Is it because of, of things or is it because of people? So, according to CDC, um, we had the first uh, COVID-19 positive uh, case in February. Although other sources says that uh, it was in January. So that doesn't really matter. Because by mid-March, all 50 states in the United States have reported uh, positive uh, cases of, of COVID-19. So that happened in mid-March. In January, we didn't have... Uh, the, the idea, we, never, we didn't have the thought that uh, in a matter of days, we would have a common enemy. So in January, or probably uh, December uh, 2019, uh, we, didn't, we didn't know, maybe some of few knew that something was giving birth, uh, 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 was getting, being born um, uh, of an enemy. So anyway, in mid-March, we all had a common enemy. Unknown, 
in January, well known in common in March. An enemy that caused uh, death, isolation, desolation, anger, anxiety, unemployment, displacement, and so on. We, we can keep mentioning uh, what this common enemy was causing to, not to, only to, to the United States, but worldwide. And the church uh, was not um, exempted from this, this, uh, this loss and this suffering. So, but what is, what is grief? And all these emotions and feelings can easily fall on the category of, uh, of grief. Uh, but what is grief? So grief is, is the response that we as human beings have to a loss. Although I have been rethinking that uh, grief is not only experienced by, by human beings, but I think also animals, uh, pets, uh, experience the loss of a, a body, a companion, or a, their, their master, their, their owner. But I'm not going to talk about uh, the grief suffered by pets. Um, so we, we experience grief because we have the loss of something or someone. And we experience these loss, these emotions, because uh, we, we created an, an, an emotional attachment, uh, connection toward these things or toward these people. Now, <coughs> usually grief uh, focuses mostly on the emotional aspect of, of, of the event, of the experience. But if you have gone through a loss, <coughs> In grief, you know that that grief affects not only your emotional aspect, but it also affects your cognitive, your social, your uh, e uh, physical, behavioral, and financial, and so on. So grief has all these these um, effects on human beings. Now. Most of us know the, uh, the cycle of grief. And if you have gone through grief lately, and, I'm, and I mean the loss of someone, uh, because someone has died in, in, in your family, someone close to you, you know that this cycle of life that most of us have heard about it, there is some truth in it, but it's not linear. It's not that uh, once you go through these stages of, of grief, you are done. So let's take a look at, at the grief that COVID-19 has uh, caused uh, on the church in, in, in society in, and see where we are. So the first, the first uh, stage, according to this cycle of grief, is denial. When we heard about this, uh, grief, this uh, virus for the first time, I think, I think it's what, it was in either January or February, but we heard that this was happening like on the other side of the world. We were thinking, oh, poor people, they are going through this. It's going to be hard for them. But we never thought that this would hit us as well in a matter of days. Some politicians um, dare to say that it was a political game played by the opposition. It was a total denial. Second stage is anger. And of course, when the state or the government uh, took the precautions of closing businesses and, and avoid crowds and closed schools and closed the church, the anger against the state or the government started showing up. And not only that, but the anger in the church, people started to be angry at, at the pastor because in the end, he is the person leading the church. Because the pastor or the staff or the board didn't have enough faith to believe that God would protect them, us, from this virus. Because in the end, we are worshiping God, we are serving God. So we should be uh, a covered shield from this virus. Second, uh, third stage is bargaining. <clears throat> so when we... Um, we accepted that the, that the virus was here, and we thought, okay, uh, the church, the building is going to be closed for 
for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, two months, three months. And we started bargaining. We said, okay, let's close it. Let's uh, give this away for the sake of my well-being, for the sake of the well-being of those whose health is more compromised. That was cool. For the stage, is depression. And I think about the kids. The kids, they go to school. When they heard that uh, the, the school was closing, they thought, oh, man, this is cool. Um, I'm glad I'm not going to, sh to, to, to school. <clears throat> and some either uh, maybe were happy that <clears throat> they were not going to church, waking up in the morning, having to take a shower, uh, getting ready. But when th those few days that we were thinking <sighs> we're going to pass f right away, so when we came, two weeks came, three weeks came, one month, two months, and those people that have not been able to go to work, those bills kept accumulating. Those who enter into any financial uh, commitment, like buying a car or buying a house, then depression starts coming and they're thinking okay what are we gonna do fifth uh stage is <clears throat> acceptance and i think right now we are in that stage where uh we are kind of thinking you know what the virus is here the vaccine maybe it's gonna be discovered created uh soon the experts say that uh, we are expecting another wave in the fall when the flu season comes. I see that some people there to be out there uh, without a face mask, uh, without protection. Maybe because they want to be infected. So this way, once they are infected, they're going to get through it and be, and be done. So that's okay. When I go to the store and I see people with no face mask, uh, and that, that's okay, that's, they can do whatever they want. But if they would know that um, I work with COVID-19 positive patients, they would not dare be close to me without me wearing a, a mask, like my friends right here. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> or them without protection. Although, when I work with COVID-19 uh, uh, patients, uh, we have the full gear, uh, the full so-called PPE. So we are, we are fine. So I think we are on this, on this stage of, of uh, acceptance. So this is the cycle of, of grief. But um, why do we grieve? <clears throat> I think that we grieve for a couple of reasons. But the main reason, I think, is because we love. Because we loved the things or the person that had died. The, of course, when, with grief, other emotions show up like regret, like guilt, like anger, and so on. But it, in the bottom of our hearts, I think there is love. That's why we are grieving. The other reason, I think... <clears throat> And, it, and this comes uh, because we're grieving the church. That's because we have been so depending on the things or the person that had died. That without those things or that person, it is, it is, it is hard for us to see ourselves moving on on life without them. So probably because we have been entitled to those things or to that person or, or that people. But <clears throat> why are we really grieving? Uh, or what are we really, really grieving? As you know, I am a chaplain at the hospital. So I do my rounds and I went to visit with this lady. I like to stop by. And so I saw her and I asked her, <clears throat> did you go to church this uh, weekend? And she said, um, no, 
And then she said, well, yes, um, but I was at home. And she said, I am missing going to church. Really? What do you miss about the church? I said. And she said, well, um, I miss worshiping. I miss being with my brothers and sisters, you know, being together. <clears throat> and then I said, well, it's funny that you say that uh, you miss all this, but you haven't mentioned the pastor. You haven't mentioned that you are missing the preaching, the message. So that made me think, um, what are we really missing or grieving? Is it the building, S wrongly called the church? Is it the fellowship? <clears throat> but the fellowship, when it comes to meeting my own needs of companion, which is good, is not bad, there's nothing wrong with that. But I was thinking, when we see someone coming new to our church, and we really value uh, a fellowship, do we include that person into our community, into our fellowship? Are we grieving worship? Is it really that we are grieving missing worship? <clears throat> or is it uh, <clears throat> our favorite style, of, of favorite genre, like, I don't know, hymnity, uh, contemporary worship music, is it, is, it, is it that that we are missing? There's nothing wrong with that because myself, I have my, my own favorite uh, musical genre. Is it the preacher? <clears throat> is it the message? Is it the style? What are we really grieving? Is it the freedom? I think that's a good question for us to, to think about. <clears throat> but I have good news for you. All that that you have been grieving, and you can have your own list, the building, the fellowship, the worship, and so on, all that is going to be given back to you in the same box. So you're going to have it in a matter <clears throat> of days. With this, I think... Um, there are two lessons that I, at, at least we, we can learn. Um, the first one is that uh, we have had <clears throat> a little taste of what millions of people go through in the United, in the United States and around the world. People with unemployment, no nice buildings, no educated staff with degrees, uncertainty, persecution, discrimination, isolation, and so on. So for us as church in the United States and in some parts in the world, <clears throat> this has been just a little taste. Second, lesson that I think we can learn. What really matters is people, it's not things, it's not the building, it's not the worship, it's not the preaching. Because without people, the building, the nice seats, the good worship band, <clears throat> the preaching is worthless. Because in the end, we do all this for people. The heart of the Gospels is John 3.16. And that reminds us uh, that God so loved the world. And of course, the word that we find in the Greek is cosmos, which means the whole world. <clears throat> Not only the human being, the humankind, but also his creation. But his 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 goal was to redeem humankind. Because once the humankind is redeemed, then the, the planet, the creation, is going to be redeemed. Because if we human beings are changed, then 
the world is going to change. The world is going to be affected. <clears throat> when Jesus celebrated, by the way, if you um, don't remember, we're going to celebrate communion today. Um, if you have some juice, grape juice, orange juice, or if you have, you, if you have no juice, just get some water and a piece of bread. <clears throat> My voice is leaving me. So anyway, um, when Jesus did uh, had the last supper, he told this to his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. And then I thought, why did he say this? Because it's so easy for us human beings to forget about what is important, what really matters. And what Jesus did on the cross was because of people, not because of anything else. He came to the world to, to save humankind. I am going to um, give you a moment of silence um, so that we can honor the lives of, of those who have died because of COVID-19. You may know some people. As I have told you, I have prayed for COVID-19 positive patients that were uh, disconnected and family uh, was there. And also for the people that have died at the hands of violence for the last events that we have been um, experiencing and seeing on, on TV. I'm going to give you, let's take a moment of, of silence. Let me pray this prayer. We confess to you, Lord, the unrest of the world, to which we contribute and in which we share. Forgive us that so many of us are indifferent to the needs of others. Forgive our reliance on weapons of terror. Our dis discrimination against people of different races in a preoccupation with material standards. And forgive us Christians for being so unsure of our good news and so unready to tell it. Raise us out of the paralysis of guilt into the freedom and energy of forgiven people. And for those who through long habit, find forgiveness hard to accept. We ask you to break their bondage and set them free through Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have a <coughs> communion. The night that uh, Jesus was betrayed, he took the breath and he said, this is my body broken for you. So he had dinner, he ate, gave thanks and told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. And after he had dinner, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And he said, every time that we participate of the bread in the cup, we remember that he came and that he will come. We see to the past, we see to the present, and we see to, to the future. Participate of the breath.
let us participate of the cup.